I'm just cl kind of glad to be here. I actually don't get to talk too often about my business, and I don't want to bore you too much with my story, but I'm going to go into it a little bit, hoping that there's places that you can kind of identify with, or you can appreciate, or you can question. You can say, I don't know why you did that, or maybe that works for me. If you can come out of this talk with one idea, I've heard this before, then maybe it was worth it. Well, I'm hoping you can come out of it with one idea, okay? Just one. And uh, we'll start with that. I'm, I'll, I'll be glad for that. So stewardship properties. Um, how many started their investment in real estate, oh, say in the years 204, 205, 206? Anybody here start during those years? Oh, we yeah. have <laughs> Leah? Okay. Okay. I did, but it was called 1980. All right. And so during the period of 1980 to 1981 or so, I bought four properties, okay? And this was in Portland. They were uh, kind of low-end properties, but uh, my timing was horrible. And uh, I saw the market starting to go down. As a matter of fact, in Oregon, many of you who are younger don't, don't have any feel for this at all, but in Oregon, we saw a depreciation of prices like at 35%, something like that and uh, interest rates shooting through the roof. Uh, it, was a, it was a bad era. And from 1980 to 86, things could go nowhere but down. In the country as a whole, there was a recession. In Oregon, it was a depression. The timber industry, which was prominent here, took a dive with the housing market. And it was, yeah, Liz, you were, uh, Dean, you know about it. Uh, it was bad news. Three banks fail in Eugene or Springfield area. Is that right? Well, here, here was Bill Sirius, a campus pastor up in, in Portland, doing real estate on the side because I kind of loved it. And uh, it, was, it was a hobby that eventually turned into a vocation. But I had no idea of the external forces that were at play here. But worse than the timing, actually, was my strategy. And worse than that was my negotiating and my construction skills and my property management. Actually, if... If, if timing was all I was working against, I would have been in good shape <laughs> because I, did, I didn't do uh, rental agreements on paper. I shook people's hands. Uh, my construction amounted to skills I had picked up, you know, in books and so forth. So I remember one of the houses that I was rehabbing that uh, the countertop, I had glued the countertop down and I came back and there was this gigantic bubble in it. I said, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So I went out and I found a a, a large uh, syringe that you could shoot glue <laughs> underneath it. And I shot glue underneath it and I put these stones on top of it just to try to get it. Well, that wasn't the worst thing about the house. Uh, I was shown it to sell finally because I just had to get rid of these houses. The market was going down there. And I had done a lot of other things, including say the uh, texture. And this couple went through it and they said, we, we kind of like the house, but God, who did the texture? It's awful. And of course I said, yeah, I, I, I just shouldn't hire it out like that. <laughs> I figured out that construction wasn't for me. Property management wasn't my uh, strong suit. What could I do? Well, um, I could move to Eugene, which is what happened actually. Uh, and I could quote uh, Winston Churchill who said, success is never final, failure is never fatal. It's a courage to continue that counts. And you need a little of that don't you, from day to day, in many ways of our life. Boy, if you need inspiration, uh, read Winston Churchill's speeches in England's Darkest Hour. So uh, I was 36 at that point. I had no properties. I had bought and sold three, uh, four properties in Portland, all, all for losses. And I relocated to, to Eugene because uh, I was doing campus ministry. I came down to U of O to do it. And uh, I didn't know whether I was going to get started again, but I thought I had, I had this experience where I had a hepatitis that I got from some restaurant and I was flat on my back for two weeks. Anybody had that before? Was that hepatitis B? I want to make sure you know it was the, it was the one, the, that one. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> What's that? Are you giving us a Did you get it? No. <laughs> No, no, Wendy's was my first office, actually. The Wendy's right down the street, right down the alley here. And uh, I read a book that became very instrumental in the turnaround for me. It was a book on property management. And the book basically said, you cannot take real estate like a hobby, which is what I was doing. You cannot, 
you know, do it informally. You've got to treat it as a business. Even if you own one house, you have a total business strategy going on from day one in that one house. And that turned my entire mindset. See, I went to college. I didn't, I didn't go to college, but I didn't have take a single business class while I was in college. I was entrepreneurial by nature, but I really wasn't very business minded. And uh, I, this book kind of turned, you know, it said, hey, get some business cards. Okay, I got some business cards. Get a name. Okay, I got a name. And get an office. Don't do it out of your house. Don't bring tenants to your house and sign rental agreements. It's way too informal. It's way too, um, yeah, it's, just, it's just not business. So that was my office. I met tenants at Wendy's and we signed rental agreements. I just happened to be out for the day for my real brick and mortar office, of course. Uh, and, <laughs> but they were, no, they were none the wiser, right? <laughs> okay, so that's how it worked. Um, that, was, that was a turnaround for me. Now, um, every business needs to make a profit, but is profit our main mission? Profit is to the body like blood and air is, or profit is like blood and air is to the body. You have got to have it or you will die as a business. It is totally critical. But do we live for the air we breathe and the blood that throw, flows through our veins? I don't think so. You know, we have to have a larger vision in our business. It's just not about making money. It is about that, but it's got to be more than that, at least... I think it does. If, if we want particularly to rally people around us, not just people who might eventually work for us, but people who rent from us, and, and just have that kind of vibe that, hey, this is bigger than me and my little family trying to make ends meet here. So what is your larger vision for your business? I really like Grace's grape nuts. I hadn't heard that. Grateful nuts. That, thank you, Grace. And I always, I always knew the last word fit her really well, but I didn't know the first word. <laughs> was so apropos as well. That's pretty cool. What am I grateful for? That's, that's pretty neat. I chose the word stewardship, and one of the reasons was because I knew I was a greedy son of a gun on the inside, really. I mean, I am very entrepreneurial. I am very, uh, you know, what's the best deal? Uh, what, how can I get myself in the best position? And I knew if I chose a word like that, that every day I came to work, I'd have to be reminded that I'm not really an owner, I'm a manager of the things I've been entrusted with. That was for me. That was a reminder for me. And it's kind of a life reminder, actually, because you know we're all just passing through this world, are we not? So how do we see ourselves? Do we see ourselves as owners of the stuff we have? Or we just see ourselves as managers of that stuff for the betterment of those around us? I wanted to be reminded of that every day. And that's why I chose that word for my own business. Our office is actually just right down the alley here, and you're welcome to visit us anytime you want. Uh, we're right across from Wendy's, and so I see my original office every time I come to work as well. <laughs> I fell into the campus rental market. Just, I was a campus pastor. I knew students. I liked students. I hung around with students. So it made sense to buy a property around the University of Oregon. Well, in 1989, it was possible to do that when I had no money. I got a loan from my dad, and uh, uh, well, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's how I first started. But whatever, wherever you start, and we've had different iterations of our business, we're in different areas now, you have to think, what is the niche that I'm going for, and how can I become really, really good at this niche market? You know, whether it's Travis at this point in his investment career, you know, uh, buying and flipping, wholesaling, properties in, in some southern states as he's doing, or, what, or whether it's somebody here in Eugene and you're on your first flip, uh, who was it who has three, who just, uh, yeah, three. So what is that niche market and how can you become the very best, you know, in, in, in your area at doing that? Because the riches truly are in the niches. You can't be good at everything but you can be good at maybe one thing. And then if you could become really good at that one thing, maybe you can become kind of good at another thing and really good at that. So start really with a narrow focus. What is your niche? What is your niche market? What is your niche skill level? What, what are your, your niche abilities? Who can help you with that? What's your team to do so? Now we're in, uh, we're in about three major markets right now. 
So 15 years from when I started, let's go to 2004. I started in 1989. Uh, I was on vacation with my wife, Teresa, and reading a book like I normally do on vacation. And uh, it was a book that just turned my life around, my business life. It was Built to Last by Jim Collins. I, I had read Good to Great, which I, I got to say, every book Jim Collins writes is worth reading. He just wrote one called Great by Choice, a very helpful book. And he used a phrase in this book uh, about that, that kind of made me question my own business. I'd, I'd come to the 15-year mark at that point, and I was thinking, who, what, are we, what am I trying to do? What's my next step? Where am I going? And he said, you know, what you want to try to do is build an enduringly great company. At least that's the kinds of companies that he studied for this book. And it was just really, it just kind of blew my mind out further than it was. I had this little family business going on. I had campus rental properties. We we're doing okay. But he said, what would it be like to put this in place of that, to build an enduringly great company? Well, I began to think about what was the parts of my company. There's, there's a management piece of the rentals I have. There's a, a construction and a maintenance piece, and then there's an investor piece. I'm going to show you this in a minute. Well, all of them were running well except, except me. I was the only investor, and I was going a hundred different ways trying to keep this thing together. There was just so many things going on. And so I, I looked at the company. I said, the big problem with my company is me. That was my paradigm shift. So what can I do about it? Well, this is kind of a strange... Uh, maybe solution, but the solution I came up with is I need to pull in more of me. I need to, I need to teach people what I do as well as at least I can do that and create more investors and kind of grow my company that way. If I have the management thing going on all right and the construction thing going on all right and the maintenance thing, then the investor thing needs to, needs to broaden out, needs to get deeper, needs to be more efficient. That's really the this isn't stewardship, this is any buy and hold strategy really. You have an investment piece of it where you acquire value through borrowed funds for purchases. You have a construction piece, you enhance the value, a management piece, and a maintenance piece. And that's just a continual cycle. It just keeps going on. That's the buy and hold strategy right there. So I put on two summer internships in 205 and 206. And I had 16 U of O and OSU business students who came for three months and hung out with me and did everything our company was involved with, from being involved in construction, property management, into uh, negotiating with sellers. We bought properties. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a fun thing. But what I was doing was a long-term job interview with these guys, trying to find the A players in the group who could come with me and no longer be interns, but be returns, and eventually become partners. So we uh, started doing that, and we actually, uh, five of them came on board with me a couple of years later, this is 207, and we had an office in, in Salem and Eugene, and eventually Portland, and uh, we just did some pretty crazy stuff. This is marketing, we had a billboard, we, we buy houses. This is a house truck, I still have this if anybody wants to buy it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> And we were just doing, you know, you get a group of 16 college students who are business majors together, and you can get some pr pretty creative ideas flowing. Mm -hmm. But you know the best marketing thing I've ever done? Is a three-line ad in the register guard that says at the top, and sorry for the brokers here, you can just uh, close your ears for a minute, it says, save the commission. <laughs> you remember it. I made more money from that three-line ad than anything I've ever done in marketing, I can guarantee you. Now, I don't think the Register Guard is what it used to be in terms of mar marketing anymore, but there's something out there that you could use for marketing that's going to help because marketing is the key to our real estate business. So, uh, unfortunately, the moment that this, these partnerships got formed and we started buying houses, the market went into free fall. So we, st we scrambled around trying to figure out what we were going to do. We started a short sale business, and we had three short sale uh, uh, we had a whole different office, an entire new office, and we were running short sales. We flipped 
nearly 200 houses in Portland, Salem, and Eugene, just one after another. And uh, amazingly, I got really restless and kind of bored over the whole thing. Flipping houses is one thing, and it's not a bad place to start. And if that's where you need to start, that's a great place to start in real estate. But the real money is in buy and holding. And so I wanted to get back to that. This, I feel, was kind of a hiatus. 15 years of buy and hold, five years of flipping. Normally, people start with a flip and they go to buy and hold, but I kind of turned it around. But I wanted to get back to buy and, buy and hold because I felt like that's where the magic of leverage can come in. And leverage builds wealth. I would say it's not the person with the most toys that wins. It's the person with the most debt that wins. The most good debt. Sorry, Dean. I <laughs> the most good debt, yeah. Well, Dean's seen our financials and not all of it's good debt. But anyway, <laughs> so what, what does that mean? Good debt is debt that isn't stuff like buying TVs and buying vacations and buying cars on you know, credit that are a little beyond where you should be buying. Good debt is buying things that have cash flow to them, whether they're businesses or real estate or whatever. That's good debt. The more good debt you can get a hold of, the better off you are. And why ever sell anything that's good debt unless you absolutely have to have the cash or you are just buried with the management of it and there are ways to get around that. But why ever sell anything that's good debt that has cash coming in? Find your cookie cutter, and that is something. If you can find the niche market that's working for you, then and it works once, do it again, do it again, do it again. I tend to get bored, and that's been my problem. I strayed from things. I bought a trucking business. Amanda doesn't even know this. I had five belly dumps going on while well, I had this internship thing going on. A total distraction, worthless waste of time. I don't know anything about trucking. And it just didn't add to our bottom line. It was just a distraction. I just think this might be another multiple stream of income. It was a multiple problem for me, okay? So what do you, what do you, what's making you money here? What's gonna uh, build the future? Focus on that, don't get bored and move away from it. Now you can push out your expertise as you get some expertise in one area of real estate. You can push it out a little bit, buy some notes, which Shondor is thinking of doing, uh, do some other things, buy commercial property when you're only in a residential property, maybe, you know, you push out, but focus on what makes you money and do it over and over and over again. So again, the buy and hold strategy, cash has gotta be at the center of it, right? Because that's what makes this thing go, go around. Either cash flow that you're getting from your rental properties or more likely loans that you're getting. Now loans are really difficult to get from banks, particularly if you have a bunch of them, then you put it, you're in a whole different category when you're going to get a loan. But private lending is a way to do it. We can talk some more about that. And you, you know, there's folks here who can help with that as well. But uh, really it's cash, cash flow and loans that make this thing happen, make the engine turn around. Well, I'd like to jump into a video here. I've been investing in real estate for over 33 years now. 23 years ago, I started Stewardship Properties in Eugene, Oregon. From one house in 1989, our company grew to over 500 houses and apartment units, most of which are around the University of Oregon, where these two middle sons of mine graduated as business majors. But the campus rental market has been discovered, and the prices, in my opinion, are just too high compared to the rents going forward. To find a low-risk, high-return alternative to campus rentals, we searched around and settled on Kansas City, Missouri. Why Kansas City, Missouri? Well, we have a lot of family nearby in Kansas. However, the main reason we're out in Kansas City is the numbers. This is the neighborhood of the house we're buying on 75th Street. Very, very pleasant neighborhood. Next to kind of a busy street, but those are the houses close to it. This is the house itself. It was a HUD foreclosure property and I think it was listed for 43000 It's actually fairly large. We put an offer in at 23000 and uh, back and forth really held our ground and they ended up selling it to us for 26000 which was a heck of a deal. 
It's actually got a nice garage and shop in the back. The house needs some work on it, probably $6,000 to $7,000 worth of work, new carpet, paint, new uh, HVAC, or at least uh, AC. It's got three bedrooms, two baths. Downstairs you'll see there's a uh, large family room and uh, we feel like it's just a great value when we have 30,000 all together in on this house or so, maybe 32. We can buy and rehab a house like 75th for $32,000 or so and then rent it out for $825 a month. The numbers simply work. In fact, they work very well. Kansas City is the major transportation hub south of Chicago and north of Dallas. It has been growing steadily and its un unemployment rate is only about 6.5%. During the real estate run-up uh, in the mid-2000s, the Missouri side of Kansas City saw significant price increases. And then when the recession hit, those prices fell to the floor. And it became one of the worst areas in the entire country for foreclosures. Let's take a case study of 8618 Oxford Avenue. It's a four-bed, one-and-a-half bath home with vinyl windows and a two-car garage. In 2005, Oxford sold for $117,800. Then look what happened. We bought this house as a Fannie Mae foreclosure in September of 2012 for $37,000. Then we put in $19,000 in repairs for a total investment of $56,000. And after a rehab of this house, we rented it to a young, upwardly mobile couple for $895 a month. When houses drop in price from $100,000 or so to around $35,000, entire neighborhoods can go into foreclosure. It even affects houses that shouldn't drop that much in price. For example, 9915 Harrison. Even long before the run-up, this house sold for $74,950 in 1997, which was likely its approximate value all the way from the late 80s to the early 2000s. We purchased it from a bank for $28,250 and then put $10,250 in ourselves for a total of $38,500. And we rented that house for $9.95 a month. Since arriving here in January of 2011, we've already seen house prices begin to rise. So you can understand why we believe we are buying these houses at their historic low point. Not only is this an unrepeatable time to be buying such properties, we are getting them for even less than most homeowners and other investors. During 2012, we made 339 offers. We make a lot of low offers, especially to lenders and banks. When we get a property, it's a good deal and sometimes it's an incredible deal. During 2012, we only got a contract on one out of 10 houses we made offers on. So when you take the exceedingly low prices with the exceedingly large number of offers, it all adds up to some great deals coming our way that have a ton of built-in equity from the day we buy them. Let me tell you a little bit of what got us to Kansas City. And uh, again, I realize not everybody is going to go to the Midwest from here, but I wanted to give you a little bit more feel for our business and why we made the decision. So as I was looking around for a place to relocate uh, and, to, and to continue a buy and hold strategy, I realized it's more difficult to do it in a place where the rent and prices, the rent's lower compared to the prices being higher. We pay a premium for living on the West Coast and the Northwest. And they pay a premium for living on the East Coast and other places in the country pay a large housing premium that is not paid in the Midwest. Traditionally, it's been thought that a property should rent for 1% of its value. So a $100,000 property should rent for thousand dollars a month but you can't get that kind of rent to cost value in many areas of the country take a home we rent in Eugene at 303 Myra Court it's worth about hundred and thirty five thousand but only rents for 995 a month that is a rent to cost ratio of not one percent but 0.73 percent by comparison you can look at uh, 5401 East 100th Street in Kansas City we're all into that for $44,000. It rents for $8.95 a month, which is a 2.03% rent to cost ratio. Or you could look at a duplex we have at 1424 North 63rd Terrace. That's in Kansas City, Kansas. We're all into that for $56,000. It rents for $5.95 a side, so $1,190 total. 
that's a 2.13% rent to cost ratio. And then every once in a while, you'll get one like 10803 Bennington Avenue in Kansas City, Missouri. We're all into that for $23,000. It rents for $750 a month, which is a 3.26% rent to cost ratio. In three years, if you had no expenses, you would own Bennington free and clear. That's pretty incredible. The idea is, uh, I think, the, one of the takeaways is what market do we have, you know? And, and just kind of dealing with, it, looking at the market for what it is. Where is your market? What is your market? And what are the value plays in your market? A value play is something where you can add value to whatever you're buying. So, I mean, I know people who buy properties on the corner because they can make them into duplexes. You know, there's a value play. Campus rental properties for years have been value plays, obviously. Uh, if you can add uh, some kind of, uh, or you can change the character in, in a house. Oftentimes, small rooms is a value play because people, you know, walk into the house and they don't like it because it's small, but hey, if you broke out a couple of the walls, you could create a great room feel in this house, and all of a sudden you've had a value play. So what is your value play as you look at a piece of property? That's really critical because we can't just buy everything at retail, even if we're kind of buying it as investors at wholesale. You know, a traditional valuation is that, uh, in the old days anyway, is that a property should rent for 1% of its value. So if it's worth $100,000, it should rent for 1% of that, $1,000. But most places in the country we're familiar with, that, cost, that rent to cost ratio is not there. It's actually less than that. Except if you go to the Midwest, there's lots of places where it's much better than that. But again, where's your market and what do you have to deal with? I would say, as a general rule, you should be in the middle of the market and maybe the lower middle of the market. The lowest place in the market are places, well, the lowest place is war zones that you want to stay out of. And I suspect that there are a few of those that we consider in the Eugene Springfield area, it's just places that you just don't want to buy. Too hard to manage, too many problems, too much headache. Some people buy there and they do very well. You have to have a certain kind of constitution, I think, to do that. So what's the next step up from the war zones? It's definitely the C neighborhoods, the, you know, things are happening there that you don't always want to know about. But those are cash flow plays because, you know, it's buying properties at a lower price point, but the rent still is relatively good in comparison to the price point you're buying the property at. You go a little higher and the rent doesn't go up much but the price goes up a value play or an equity play is even more so again it's higher to get in in terms of the cost but what you have going for you, you have less management hassle and you have a greater potential for appreciation so you see where this the great the good and great deals are there's kind of a sweet spot there again ask yourself the question what's this sweet spot that i'm targeting for my investment opportunities here in Kansas City, we've kind of figured out, we buy a little of some properties in each one of those, and we know what we're getting into. If we're buying cash flow properties, we know they're gonna be more difficult to manage. We're just gonna to have to put up with that. If we buy equity play properties that are higher uh, in terms of what they cost, they're gonna be less cash flow for us. They're gonna, we're gonna hope on appreciation, if that may be a hope, or we're gonna basically keep the property and uh, you know, realize that it's probably gonna be a lot less hassle, but it's not gonna make us as much in cash flow. This just happens to be a map of Kansas City and we've kind of outlined where those areas are for us. Again, where the cash flow areas are, where the value areas are, where the equity areas are, our target markets. Kansas City is about the size of Portland, but way more spread out in terms of population. It's Again, going back to the buy and hold strategy, cash is really important and leverage is what it's all about. So where do you find private lenders and where do you find bank partners as well? Well, I, I wanna take some questions about anything you have questions of and this will be one of them. But what we've done is we've essentially just begun very small with the flips that we were doing back in the 205 to 210 era 
and we, we drew people in that we knew. You know, it started with my dad. That's how I started out. I borrowed money from him, actually. So from day one, I had a private lender uh, that was helping me get started. Soon after that, it was associates I was meeting and other people, and I met some hard money lenders as well, and I borrowed money from anybody who would loan me money, and for them, of course, it had to make sense to do so. Who, who is in your sphere that might believe in you in terms of a property? Can you show them the numbers? Can you show them that what your strategy is, what you plan to do with the property, and, and bring them in your team? Again, what kind of interest rate, what kind of return are they going to want to do that? Go from there. These are just uh, things that you need to do when you do that. We don't need to go through them specifically very much, but there's a note involved. There's a first deed of trust. There's evidence of insurance that, that a private lender will need. And finally, uh, they'll need statements for tax purposes. Let me just end by uh, talking about a few books that have been really important to me. One of them is probably many of you read this. How, how many people have read this? Uh, Gary Keller's book. Uh, it's uh, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. I would say this is the book to start with as, a, uh, as an investor. If you haven't read it, his principles are really worth reading. He's got two other books in the series. The second one's a green book. It's called Flip. If you're doing flips, you've got to read that book. It's just worth it. His third book is yellow. It's called Hold. So it's, uh, you can kind of get the idea from that. The other author that I would really encourage you to read is Jim Collins, who wrote Built to Last, Good to Great, Great by Choice. All those books are well worth, well worth the time. Again, you're growing a business. Even if you have one rental property, it is a business. You need to treat it that way. Well, thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity. To be here.